Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is Jonathan Welton here with our next podcast interview. I've been looking forward to this one. And part of my goal with, with all these podcasts this summer has been to introduce you to people that uh, you may have never come across, whether you're in the uh, the Bethel stream or the Better Covenant theology stream or whichever, wherever you're coming from, you may not know all of our guests. And you may not have heard of our guest today, David Winston. You may have heard of his father, but even then, uh, not everybody's heard of everybody. But uh, I had the honor to go speak at his family's church out in Chicago, Illinois, about 15 years ago. I was trying to figure out this morning, uh, 15 years ago, and I got invited out of the blue. And being the the rural, upstate New York white boy that I am, I had never heard of Bill Winston before. I, you know, shocker to some people. Um, but this this uh, Bill Winston has a church in Chicago, which my numbers might be off. They might be 15 years old. But at the time, it was 19,000 members attending, and there was a uh, two campuses and one one campus literally attached to a mall that the church owned. And mm-hmm. Pastor Winston would go back and forth between his two churches where he would fly back and forth because he's also a uh, Air Force pilot. And uh, just I may be getting some details wrong, but this this was... Uh, a shocking revelation when I when I actually figured out where I was going to speak. And so 15 years ago, uh, David and his wife Nikki were there and we we got to interact briefly. And apparently we've stayed in touch over the over the years and just recently have gotten some more conversation going. And I am thrilled to bring my friend David on the show with us today. David, say hello for everybody. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Jonathan, for uh, having me on this podcast. I'm really excited to get into this conversation today, and it's uh, truly an honor to join you. Wonderful. And David, I, I've i been watching your Instagram recently. You just published a book. Now, I'm I'm guessing this might not be your first book. Is it, how, is it your first book? This is my first solo book. Um, the first book that I put out, uh, Nikki and I did together, and it was actually a... Um, young men's devotional a boys devotional wow okay okay so this is quite different this this book especially the topic uh has really stood out to me and so mm-hmm. when i was watching you talking about it and uh the the title authenticity is just such a word that's been resonating with me uh it's it's a word i've been on this journey myself and so i thought oh here we go this this is this is a book concept that the body needs right now now is that the full i don't know if that's the full title is there a subtitle to it yes uh the confidence to be yourself the courage Mm -hmm. to release your greatness ah yes beautiful and uh i i to be you know upfront, i haven't finished the book yet but I'm, i'm about halfway through and uh, you know, it shares your journey. It shares this process of growing up in a ministry home, a famous home, and learning to know yourself and be yourself and not live in a shadow. And uh, even the the process of becoming more and more yourself in ministry in the ministry world. Um, if you were to go back, where how far back would you say this journey has been for you? You know, this journey, um, this journey of writing the book really started eight years ago. But I think the feelings that I convey in the book, I mean, they started even predating going into ministry Um, because I went into ministry. I was, oh, let's see, I was 24 years old, I believe, when I went into ministry. Um, And but, you know, for the first several years, I was just. You know, I was doing ministry um, and doing it by faith as we should, but I was really kind of struggling to find my own footing, to understand, you know, who I was, especially, you know, in the shadow of of such a great man of God who had accomplished so much already, Um, you know, it's kind of intimidating. And so it's interesting, you know, I'm celebrating on one hand, right? And so I'm celebrating with him the victories, but on the other hand, I'm nervous because I'm like, 
how do I live up to that? And so, you know, it's, it's been an ongoing journey, but uh, God really started to stir my heart when the several years passed uh, to be able to put this book out because there's other people who can relate to it um, and relate to that journey, even though they may not be pastor's kids, but we all can relate to that journey of discovering and finding our authentic self and wondering, do we have what it takes to do the assignment and fulfill the dream that God has placed in our heart? You know, wondering, are we the right person for the job? And, uh, and out of it uh, came this book, Authentic. I, um, uh... I, this book was not available at the time, but if I go back about six years ago, I was uh, sitting in a counselor's office and I was processing some stuff. And at the end, she shared with me, you should check out this book called um, Abba's Child by Brendan Manning. And I, I'd i heard of Ragamuffin Gospel, which is like his best selling book, mm -hmm. uh, but I'd never heard of this. I got the audio and he shares this concept of there's the authentic you at the core, and then there's the false self that you build up for the world, for approval, to make people happy with you, mm -hmm. um, and that there's like a war between these two. Uh, how would you how would you say you relate to that? And was that a big part of your process, your journey? Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that. oh yeah, definitely. Because I think you know, growing up in. Um, and I guess we can call it a mega ministry or, or a ministry that's so exposed and, you know, has impact and influence uh, all over the world. Um, you know, growing in that and growing up in that spotlight, you know, I had this tension that I was constantly managing to try to understand who I should be and how I should be. Should I be more like my dad? Should I try to understand and be more like myself? Um, you know, I'll give you some real stories, Jonathan. I remember when I came, um, back from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, took over the youth ministry. My dad also wanted me to take over as the international director of Bill Winston Ministries, something to which I felt like I was uh, under-equipped and ill-qualified for. You know, I didn't have a degree in organizational leadership. I didn't have an MBA, um, those kind of things. You know, I, I, so there was a period there where I questioned dad. I said, well, dad, you know, maybe we might not be hitting, you know, the best of God right here. You know, maybe we're not hitting the mark. <laughs> maybe we should pray about this a little longer. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, son, you can do it. You know, you got the Holy Spirit. And um, I, I remember going into some of our meetings and our devotional meetings for the first, you know, three months or so. And I think the thing that was such a gripping reality to me is here I am leading a staff. And at that time it was like you know maybe a dozen people and 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 now it's more like three dozen but um leading this staff of people who most of them jonathan were females and most of them were old enough to be my mother like okay. there's a few that were old enough to possibly be my grandmother so i think in we, our context we won't tell them that though they might <laughs> yeah yeah we, we don't have to tell them. And, and they're wonderful wonderful people they're wonderful yeah. ladies you know uh most of them since have, have moved on from the ministry um but you know I, I was sitting here trying to lead these meetings and i'm like part of my brain is like okay you know this is what we need to do and go over and the other part of my brain is like why would they even want to listen to me like i'm the same age as their kid or their grandkid and yeah. because of the context of our environment in our ministry, our ministry um, skewed a little bit older anyway. And so now I'm the youngest, I'm the new kid on the block. I'm the youngest senior staff member in the ministry. So not only am I feeling that pressure because I'm pastor's son, but I'm also feeling that pressure because I'm the anomaly. Like I I'm, I'm the different one in the room. And so because of that, I struggled with trying to flow between like, should I be more like the elder saints, right? Should I be more like them? Or is God counting on me to usher in something new and fresh from my generation, from my perspective, from the way he created me? And so I, I kind of wrestled with that dichotomy for a while. Wow. I, I I love what you're bringing up. And I didn't hear you say the word, but it's, it's, it's really the contrast between authenticity and the insecurities that we face, mm -hmm. and, you know, those, you, they really are, it's like light and darkness or love and fear, mm -hmm. like authenticity and insecurity are at war with each other. And uh, yeah. 
So in that process, what were you finding that helped you gain to that point of security and being your authentic self? Because that sounds like it was a struggle that went on for a season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I would venture out to say it went on for a few seasons at least. <laughs> and 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 I think what I found is the more that I was my authentic self, the more I was true to who God has called me to be, to respond to situations, uh, you know, respond in meetings, to teach the messages that God gave me and lead the way God had put it in my heart as I served my father, the better results that we would see. And it's like, it's like the spirit of God continued to ride on my authenticity. Like when I would be true to who God is calling me to be and doing it the way God was calling me to do it, it was like there was a, a newness, a freshness, an anointing that rode on that. And, and, you know, for the first several years, we were doing things that hadn't been done yet. And we were constantly feeling like we were almost like, I guess I could speak for myself, almost feeling like I was like going against the grain, right? Because especially when you're um, dealing with certain demographics, there could be a feeling that, you know, let's do it the traditional way. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, and the minds of some that I was working with, they were very much tied to that kind of traditional thinking, that traditional mindset. And I, I mean, I can remember the first time that I proposed doing registration digitally only and not on, on a paper, you know, not, not on a, what do they call it? The, uh, the carbon copy paper. Okay. And, and, yeah. and they were like, well, well, how was that going to work? You know, and, and I know that's just such a simple example, yeah. but I found that as I did it and tried to really push to do those things that I felt like God was putting in my heart, whether they were, you know, very natural things or they were very spiritual things, I found that instead of going against the grain, I began to lead the way because others started trying to adopt what we were doing and others wanted to be a part of you know, what God was leading me to do. And so instead of feeling like I'm going the opposite way, it's like almost like leading a trend toward the direction that God is saying to go in the spirit, um, you know, as we fulfill the vision that God had given our man of God. And so, you know, there's something I say in my book that I really believe holds true is that God is counting on our difference to make the difference. And I think that that couldn't be any truer. Uh, God, and I've seen it in my life, that God often counts on my difference to make the difference. And when we undersell our ability to make a difference, I believe that we water down our power to make a difference. Wow. I, I, there's so many things inside of that. One that stands out to me is that as you started to become more secure and lead from your authentic self, you became trusted more. That's what I hear inside the mm -hmm. store, that people were willing to follow that leadership. And there's something so attractive and drawing and trustworthy about somebody who's at their authentic core. Yeah. And we may not realize why we're, we feel connected, why we feel drawn, uh, but there's something about, oh yeah, that's, that's real. And, mm -hmm. and there's an integrity to it. Uh, but when somebody, they put on the uh, Saul's armor, they're wearing, mm -hmm. the, you know, doing the thing to please the tradition and all of that, that fakeness, we, there's an automatic repelling and mm -hmm. even the insecurity that the person is operating in makes us insecure in trusting or not trusting them. Yes. You know, those dynamics that people don't realize. Yes. And you just described that that's exactly what you walked out. And absolutely. Yeah. So so in the in the process of your journey, uh, did you find did you, from I, I would imagine we we heard what your father said that you know you can mm -hmm. do it you have the holy spirit i believe in you so you you had a really good earthly father share cheering you on mm -hmm. were there other anchors uh in your life whether it was um you know brothers friends uh other fathers spiritual mothers that were helping push you toward authenticity Yes, yes, definitely. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm so thankful even to this day because God had blessed me and, and we still have a great team, but God, I think he, it's almost like God insulated me. Like, I feel like God favored me by giving me such a good, strong team, being so young, you know, being young in the ministry, you know, grew up in church all my life, but but I was young in the ministry. And he gave me a couple key people around me that had been doing ministry for years, whether it was youth ministry or working in high level ministry um, and, and a couple brothers around me that weren't in our ministry, but were familiar with ministry, who had been pastoring in ministry for some years. And it was just amazing that it's like God brought all the right people at the right time in the right season into my life. You know, some of these people I had kind of known before, but we weren't closely connected, right? You know, you just kind of have your acquaintance people, but you know, God kind of brought us together quickly once I entered into that season. And, um, and, and they really helped really just almost like breathe life or, or I think about it like blowing oxygen to the fire, right? It, it's like, you know, when that fire gets oxygen and when, you know, the most dangerous thing for wildfire is to have windy conditions, right? Because it just can spread like wild. And they just continue to really blow on, on my gift, on my abilities, on what God had already been saying to me about, you know, being your authentic self. But, you know, Jonathan, if, if I'm honest, I think it was the revelation that God spoke to me one morning when I was on my back porch, you know, just kind of praying and meditating. Um, and this was several years ago. And he spoke a word to me and he said, you can never do what your father has done or accomplish what your father has done. And, you know, to be honest, at the moment, I was discouraged. I said, well, thank you, Holy Ghost. Like, you have confirmed my suspicion. Right, right. I'm yeah. Just a little smack in the face. But then what he said next really set me free. He said, and your father wouldn't be able to do what I've called you to do. Because the way you're equipped is perfectly paired with the purpose to which you've been called to. And, and that was the light bulb moment for me, man. I mean, like when I understood that God has equipped us for the purpose, it all brought it into context. Like, I've been looking at this from the other way around. I've been looking at this, trying to accomplish God's purpose for my life, studying my dad. And of course, you know, we can imitate those who, um, you know, who through faith and patience, you know, they inherit the promise and, and we imitate those who have gone before us, but we don't try to be them. You know, we, we study those principles and, and, and we are encouraged by their life and their testimony, but we have to be our authentic selves. And I think that, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, I think it's so easy in the church world to kind of get stuck in this place, especially because we have so much access to so many other people. We get stuck becoming carbon copies of people. Like we're regurgitating other people's messages and other people's revelations and trying to dress like this person, trying to style like this person, trying to run our service like this church. And I mean, listen, hey, I love great church, right? But every everybody can't do worship like Elevation Worship, right? You know what I'm saying? Like everybody can't run a service like Bethel can or everybody can't preach like a Bill Winston or a T.D. Jakes. Like it, it just is. And the thing that makes them so effective is they've decided that they're going to do it the way God has graced them to do it. And so when God spoke to me in that moment, I think that was really one of the catalytic points for writing this book, Authentic, because it started to give me a whole different perspective on who I was and why I was called for the assignment. And, and it started to help me understand that it wasn't just because my last name is Winston, but it's because God needs what I carry. He put inside of me what is needed for the growth and evolution of this church and of the ministry. Wow, I'm, I'm thinking as you're talking, even of King David and Solomon, like mm -hmm. they both did amazing things, but they, they were assigned to different things. David was not allowed to build the temple mm -hmm. and Solomon was called to build the temple. But that momentum and even the fact of, you know, in your case, uh, you have this this momentum 
but it's not that you're supposed to copy and reproduce everything, but yeah. it's that you're supposed to take what your purpose, your assignment, your calling and go where, where you're called to go, which is, uh, is going to be its own thing. And in the, in the process of that, I, I think for, for those who are listening, we, we have the, the reality and sometimes we forget because we look at other people and we think, uh, well, you know, they, they're called of God or mm -hmm. their business is successful and they are a rock star. They are a celebrity. There's this thing and we separate ourselves instead mm -hmm. of actually anybody that's willing to dig deep into authenticity is going to make an impact. Yes. Uh, I think even this week, I don't know if you've heard this song yet, but it's been the rage on social media. And it, uh, but there's this this young country musician who wrote a song, put it out on social media. Joe Rogan shared it. Benny Johnson, the news anchor guy, shared it. Like everybody mm -hmm. shared this thing, and it went immediately to the number one on Spotify and iTunes. And wow. I don't know if this kid has ever released anything before, but. <laughs> <laughs> I got his name right. It's it's Oliver Anthony. Okay. Uh, the song is called Rich Men North of Richmond, which is Washington, D.C. So okay. it's a song about what's happening in D.C. But the intensity that comes out of this, this the vocals and the the voice and but it's the heart like you can <laughs> feel it like like. These people are not taking care of us. We are struggling out here. Mm. And I mean, I don't like country music. I'll tell you, <laughs> I live in, we moved down to South Carolina from upstate New York and I despise, I cannot handle country <laughs> music whatsoever. Mm. But when I heard this, like tears came to my eyes because the intensity of his authentic heart being communicated. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, it hits hits like a hammer. And that's what we see when, when you see a a new musician, a new author, a new something, and it comes out with this so much power of authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a whole bunch of people try to copy. And yep. like you were talking about with imitate, like like you see John Wimber wearing a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops, and then thousands of vineyard pastors wearing Hawaiian shirts and flip-flops, like <laughs> It's yeah. not the Hawaiian shirt that made the difference. But, yeah. You know, if you got free of a suit, good for you. God bless. But you know, <laughs> you know, maybe that's what you needed. But the authenticity of of that is it. It's usually like the the head of a tribe, you know, mm -hmm. and it makes this wave of of people. Um, and so even in the, I just want to say for anybody like as you're listening to this. It says in, in Acts 17, 26 or 28, one of those that you were born at a specific time and a specific place. Mm -hmm. So God knew, I mean, God could have had you born 400 years ago in, yeah. you know, Malaysia, but yeah. he decided to take your spirit and put it into a body and yep. you have one in four trillion chance that you're going to be the one that he put into that body at this time, at this place, yeah. there's a purpose to it. Absolutely. And our, our whole culture nowadays with all this evolutionary theory removes people's purpose and value. Mm -hmm. If you are an accident, you have no reason to be here. The cosmos created itself or the aliens dropped you here or whatever and you have no purpose therefore you have no value mm -hmm. if we decide not to abort you and keep you around well you better just keep your head down and whatever you know yeah. versus that's not reality like yeah. god had a plan he had a purpose he had a timing and a place to put you here and you you better get in touch with what that is and do your assignment like it's it's a good thing to actually be in touch with it because you'll be fulfilled when you're walking in your authenticity. Yeah. But how do you ever find your authenticity if you're here by accident? Yes. Yes. You know, Jonathan, I, I think I think so much of authenticity is perspective driven because, you know, you said a key word, 
value. And and that's really what I look to do, you know, with my book. And and I even start off the first chapter talking about the importance of your significance, because if people don't think that they're significant, their lack of significance is always already working against them to try to undermine the necessity to be authentic, to be who they are called to be, because they don't think that they have anything of value to bring to the table. And I, I think that that's the thing, especially with young people that you know kind of bothers me the most is when their value and their significance is being stripped and taken uh from them because you know the enemy in a very craftily way you know he wants to to rob people of their significance but you know as you were just saying you are no accident you know nobody uh, like what my dad says he says nobody can sneak into the back door of her you know everybody was a purposeful, calculated decision. And even as it says, as David writes in Psalm 139 and verse 13 and 14, you know, he says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. But before that, he says that you form me, you, you form my inner parts in my mother's womb, which was a very calculated movement and decision and series of decisions. Because I like to say that God has solutions walking all over the earth. We just have to discover who they're inside of mm. and what face they have. But God has a solution for everything that we're facing. And I think sometimes the deficiencies that we see in society may be, may be because the people that are holding those solutions may not be equipped with the courage or the confidence to step forward and really express that solution through their specific personality and perspective that God has given them, maybe because it's so different or it's not like other people's. And, and that's where we kind of get stuck in this loop of trying things and trial and error and stuff that doesn't work. And, you know, and, and, and we're kind of in this space where we're like, okay, God, like what's going on? You know, we need to pray, but I believe that, you know, we don't pray and walk away. We pray and participate. And our role in participating is that we understand that God has created us for a purpose. And we express that purpose specifically the way that he has created us to express it. Just like you said, the gentleman who, who wrote the country song, you're not even a country song fan, but it, it's, it's reached you. And what that means to me is that every gift has a, has a built-in audience that has already been installed here in this earth. And when we're authentic, it actually gets the attention of those who have been earmarked as our audience already. But sometimes if we're like searching for audiences and I tell our young people, you know, don't, don't, don't search to try to like be an influencer. Don't like try to find the audience. Just discover you and let you emanate. Let God use you through who you are and your audience will find you. True enough, I know you have marketing and different tools and tactics that you have to use. But I really believe that when we seek to please the father through doing what he's called us to do through purpose, the audience, they'll always find you because everybody is always searching for something original. They're searching for the authenticity. It, it seems to get our attention on a frequency that is beyond just kind of our natural you know, cognition, just our natural conscience. It's like there's a built-in recognition system that happens and is activated when I see that Jonathan is doing and being exactly who Jonathan has be created to be. And it, it, it I think it's designed to attract. It's designed to draw. Wow. I I feel like there's a big sailor in there. And maybe <laughs> maybe it's just like landing for me, but that that piece of the earmarked built-in audience for the assignment, the gifting that you carry, and for the authenticity that you are, that they're they're out there. And it's it's not everybody. But it is yeah. the ones that are that are called to your metron, and it's mm -hmm. like yeah, absolutely, man. What a good point. I um, as we were talking a few minutes ago, I was thinking uh, there's there's a um, there's a guy who's a former CIA operative who he's retired and he's sharing you know things that he's allowed to share, mm -hmm. and uh, he was doing an interview and he said one of the first things that you learn at the CIA when you're being trained is that uh, there's a certain level of childhood trauma that creates very successful people. Mm. And if you don't have the certain level of trauma, then 
you know, you just kind of go through life and do whatever. And if you have too much trauma, you become an alcoholic, a drug addict, a sex mm -hmm. addict, you know, whatever your coping mechanism. Uh, but if you get just the right amount of childhood trauma, it produces people that are extremely driven. And yeah. it goes back to the word significance that you were talking about, that yeah. they're driven for a need for significance. Yeah, uh, I was trained a few years ago as a, a Tony Robbins coach as well. And one of the things, one of the big foundations he uses in uh, his understanding of human nature is the six human needs and one mm -hmm. of them is the need for significance mm -hmm. if it becomes your top need and literally drives your life it will cause a mess in your life because you also need connection and you need certainty and uncertainty and and you need uh let's see growth was another one so there's there's these six yeah. needs but when you put significance at the top you'll accomplish a lot but you'll also create a lot of damage in your life yeah. And so, you know, when when we talk about significance that people need to have that, I, I it's it's a good reminder for us all that it's not an external significance that we get from what we accomplish, but having that internalized significance that then we can actually be authentic. Yes. I, I've been down that road of uh in the years past of chasing outside things. Like I can <laughs> myself specifically i didn't feel connected to my own masculinity now mm -hmm. i knew i'm a man but and i like women like it wasn't like a gender confusion we're gonna get the clear that you know get clear. Sure. <laughs> that was never a challenge <laughs> but for me it was i would constantly feel emasculated i would feel mm -hmm. this security and this emasculation whether it's in conversation with my wife or other leaders or whatever and yeah. I would try to do what you do to feel like a man, whether I'm going to have more camping trips and light more fires and uh, be a hunter and do martial arts and do contact sports and, you know, all the mm. man things. But that's external. Mm. Didn't actually land for me into my authentic core where I'm like, no, I am not. I this is not even an issue anymore which uh, yeah. for me it was the process when I learned about uh, what we call terms in the bulletproof husband the, the group I, I help run now uh, the bulletproof husband talks about internalizing your terms and knowing who mm. you are at the core That's and good. connected with that it was it was it shifted everything like I can literally say now in the last three years, there's just nothing my wife can say or do that makes me feel emasculated. Wow. Every it changed the context on everything. But wow. I was living in insecurity that would constantly come up. And I was trying to gain something from the outside to feel that significance. And mm. when when you actually internalize this stuff, you start to realize, you know, we're if you're raised with mommy issues then you're going to have issues in your relationship with women where you're trying to gain something to fill a void. And, yeah. you know, same with, with men. If you, you know, grew up with daddy issues, you're going to have the same thing. And, you know, all this external stuff is, is really coming down to internalizing it, whether it's an emotional lack and you need an emotional healing or whether it's a spiritual lack and you need something spiritually to connect. Um, so, you know, I, this is just such a, to me, it's such a important and personal conversation because, you know, this, this topic is, uh, especially a lot of ministers I find are, they feel isolated. They're on mm -hmm. a path. They're up in front trying to lead everybody. They feel like I can't really let out all of what I'm feeling, processing. Yeah. Even if I share with another minister, he might stab me in the back. Like, you know, the the concerns, the the fears that are there. And so to actually say, okay, how do we walk this process to become authentic? Yeah. To in, integrate with ourselves. Um, so if we were to say, let's take all of that stuff I just threw at you. Um, what would be your advice especially to uh, people who, who feel like 
maybe I don't have anybody around me right now that I share with. I, I don't even know if I'm honest with myself. Yeah. I, I, let alone being fully honest with anybody else, or maybe nobody's listening. I feel like nobody sees me or hears me. Uh, and I'm telling them I'm, I'm drowning. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not connected with my authentic self. I'm disconnected. Yeah. yeah. What, what practical next steps would you see? Sure. And, 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 um, and thank you for sharing, you know, with me and, and with us that part of your journey. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, before I answer that question, I am such a proponent of health and not, not just physical health, that too, but just being whole as a person. I find that there's way too many like broken people that are trying to power through and do ministry. It's alarming, like alarming. And, you know, whether it was, you know, amplified by the pandemic or, or other situations that you know, are pandemic adjacent, I'm not sure. But what I do know, and, and you sparked something when you said that we're drowning at the end of 2020, I can only describe what it felt like for me. I felt like I was drowning. Like it was just, it was just getting dark and, and I needed help. And I'm so thankful that I had an amazing wife who saw and recognized the warning signs and said, David, we need to get you some good help. You, you need, you need some help. And, and I wasn't stuck in sin, right? Like I wasn't living a sinful lifestyle. I, I had good family, had a good marriage. My, my children I have four awesome children together with my wife wasn't having any um, money issues, but yet the the weight of what I was going through as a minister and trying to deal with the needs and minister to the needs of people and all the nuances that come with serving in ministry. And it was just weighing so heavy that I needed help. And, and part of the answer that I'm actually going to give to you know the viewers here with the question that you asked is get a good therapist, get some good godly counsel, because she helped connect me with a great therapist who's a you know born again believer and and pastors as well, but has been phenomenal, and not just my ability to really kind of get whole, but Jonathan he's been phenomenal in my ability to become self aware in areas that I was blind. Like there's a saying that says, you don't know what you don't know. But I'll add to that, what you don't know, if you continue not to know, could lead to your demise. Yeah, it'll hurt you. It, it'll, it'll hurt you. But if you don't take time to discover what's hurting you, you'll, it's like you'll start to be hurt and not even know why and how to articulate it, much less know how to ask for help. And I think going to therapy was the best thing that happened to me because it led me actually on this trail and progression of understanding that, wait a minute, I have some deficiencies. Like there's some things that I grew up in a great Christian household with two parents that love me and a strong ministry, but there are some things that that didn't teach me that has led to my lack of awareness that has led to me being in this place where I'm feeling real low and this can't continue on in a healthy way for too much longer. It's going, it's going to end up to a very unhealthy place. And so what I learned is that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't trying to leave faith in God. What it was is understanding how I can submit myself in a greater way to God's healing process. It gave me language to things that I, I was feeling. It gave me awareness and knowledge to things that I was kind of discerning, but I, I didn't know how to articulate. And so, you know, therapy, uh, good, good books, good materials that were suggested to me to help to try to understand. There's actually one um, book. Uh, it's called People Fuel by Dr. John Townsend. And it's talking about what motivates people and, and helping us understand what communication is like with people, but not just that, but what makes people tick and, and how to make sure that all the relationships in your life are whole. And out of that, even though it was more focused on trying to understand others, as a byproduct, I started understanding myself, right? And, and, and I think, you know, what you're talking about 
it, it reminds me of a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And some people think that the highest, you know, the highest pinnacle at the top of the hierarchy of needs is um, self-esteem, but it's not. It's actually self-actualization. It's the full manifestation and understanding of the significance that you carry and being able to fully make good on the, the potential that you carry. It's, it's that moment that says like, wow, I have something of significance to offer the world and I'm releasing it and people are better for it. Things are better for it. It's that moment of self-actualization. And I think what happens is if we're not whole, we never tend to reach that moment of self-actualization. And it's like, as I've understood how to be whole, you know, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, how to have language to certain things that I was feeling, understanding, or maybe discerning, how to take care of those things, how to pull back and have enough balance to be able to serve the needs of people, but then also to tell them, no, 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 this is family time, or this is time that I need for me. Because if, if I'm not good, what good can I be to anybody else? And so, you know, just those things that I think really have helped. Um, and, and I think that really ties back into having a sense of significance to know that you're worthy of taking a break, taking time out for yourself, getting healing and help and seeking help for yourself. Like it's worth your time. You're worth the effort. And I want to say to somebody who might be listening to this, your wholeness is worth it. It's worth the effort that you put in. Your wholeness is absolutely worth it. It is just as significant as someone else that you might be trying to help the next day. But you're, you know, sometimes I, I think we just, and I'm not trying to go off in this rant, but I feel really, really um, okay. just, I'm really passionate about this. I'm passionate about people just being whole. And, and I think that as we're whole, we can value ourselves the right way and, and really accelerate in our journey of authenticity. I, I, I love that you felt drawn to go there because it's it's been such a core part of these podcasts over the summer is really bringing in guests that are hitting this from a different angle. We had a, mm -hmm. uh, I had one gentleman that we did an interview with who uh, he was over 700 pounds for his six years of his life, could not get out of his bed. His wow. Had ridden for six years and he shared his journey of losing the weight, walking into wholeness. And uh, the next week I had a, a friend who is a fitness trainer in uh, Cal or, uh, Maui. She actually is on the island of Maui. And so wow. been in touch with her with all the fires going on right now and um, but she she shared how she went to ministry school and was completely burnt out and had to mm -hmm. take a year of fixing her health and eating healthy and sleeping in for a year and yeah. the recovery process. And, you know, that that process of wholeness and how important it is. And I think that that's one of the one of the terms that's been really helpful for me over the last few years has been coming to understand what spiritual bypassing is mm -hmm. and how we as believers we do it so very much you know if you're, <laughs> if you're 300 pounds overweight we're going to declare that our body is the temple of the holy spirit and we're going <laughs> to keep eating the cheeseburgers right and if, if you're in a hundred you know two hundred thousand dollars of student debt you're going to declare things over your finances and you're just going to pay your interest and not the principal, right? <laughs> like this is, <laughs> we, we just don't actually fix our whole life and deal with our emotions and our physical body and our finances and our sex life and our marriage and all these things are important. But the church, we've created a culture that's spiritual only. And that's not the culture that Jesus spoke to when he mm -hmm. showed up. When he showed up, they had a culture that was family based. They had the Mosaic law. They had, this is how you handle your money. This is how you handle your marriage. This is how you handle, you know, song of songs, how you handle your sex life. Like yeah. it's all built into the culture. So he brought the spiritual peace into the conversation and he fixed what needed to be fixed. But we, over the course of a few hundred years, a few thousand years, we've lost the culture of the kingdom 
that's yeah. all those other pieces of wholeness. Yeah. And so I, I see, you know, this is what I believe one of the next things that we'll see in the church is a wholeness of faith, feelings, finances, fitness, that these these are going to come together yes. and that we'll have believers that are are a light in all the areas and they're integrated in all the areas. Yes. And that's for me that that requires authenticity. Yes. I, I, I love that, Jonathan. I mean, I just, it just makes me smile even hearing you say that because I really believe that that's what God has called us to do, you know? And, and, and like you said, you know, that's, that's, I believe what Jesus came to incorporate and help us establish is just that prospering in every single area of our lives. And, and honestly, I believe that maybe people who are, are believers or church folks and, you know, spiritual you know, maybe we might have shied away, you know, inadvertently even sometimes from the accountability of that area, you mm-hmm. know, and, and and to be honest, like, and I know you say, hey, let, like, let's be real on the podcast. I actually think sometimes it's easier for somebody to bathe something with the scripture than to actually change. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, just, I'll just quote the scripture. And so I, I can prove to you that I'm, you know, I'm taking it to God and, you know, and, and, and I'm confessing the word over it. And that's important too. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't absolve us from the responsibility to actually change, to actually watch our diet or to actually manage and steward our money well, or to actually spend time with our family. Like, like I can confess the word of God over my kids, but at the end of the day, God has given them to me to steward. I actually have to raise them. Right. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah, absolutely. So, so prayer is an essential part of that. But I believe that one of the, the, the assets of prayer, especially as a parent, is that God begins to reveal things to you through the Holy Spirit, right? And so you start to know and understand things maybe about your kids that maybe they're not saying or, or you can't naturally know just by yourself. And, and so now it not only informs your prayer specifically, but it informs you on a natural level on what conversations to have, what to do, what, what to implement in your house or, or how to make the changes that are necessary so that they can continue to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm really a big fan of accountability and responsibility to not use the scripture irresponsibly, but to let the scripture be your foundation with your whole mindset being fixed toward wanting to use the scripture as a platform to help propel you into making those actual changes so you can be healthy, you can be whole and live the life that God wants you to live. Wow. I, yeah, man, I just love how much overlap there is in what you're hearing and walking in and what I'm living in right now too. And, and it's just, it's, it's beautiful, man. And I, I, I hope that there are thousands of leaders around our age that are uh, hearing the same thing and ready yeah. to pick this up. Cause I believe this is the heart of the Lord right now for the church. And mm-hmm. it's part of where, where 2020 was like a snow globe and you just shook everything and it was mm-hmm. like hey you're not okay <laughs> like and you're yeah all your stuff all of us you know came to the surface i mean the the divorce rate spiked the suicide rate spiked the drug addiction like everything spiked yeah and it it brought to the surface all the stuff that we have to look at and deal with and and I, I don't believe people have gone back to sleep. I believe people are still navigating this because now we're watching, you know, the Biden crime family and we're watching this and we're watching, you know, all the <laughs> so it's like, it just keeps going. It's like, yeah, 2020 was just the door opener, but there's so much that's being shaken and people are waking up. And I, from what I'm seeing, the, the, those who are awake are taking more responsibility for their life to mm-hmm. say, I've got to get on track. It, yeah. I, can't, I can't go like this for the next 40 years. I've got to get on track. My finances are jacked up. My relationship stinks. My health is out of order. I've got to fix this. And yeah. I see it more and more. And I, I see it in the church. I see it in the world. I, mm-hmm. I, I, secular men's leaders and groups and stuff that are saying like 
you you got to get ready because we're not at the place we need to be for our finances for all of these different areas and yeah. i just believe it's it's being trumpeted so loud that, yeah. that you know it's in the church and in the world everybody's getting a, a shake up of it's it's time to get straight yeah absolutely and and you're right i mean it's it's the clarion call for us especially as men um because you know the bible says that if the foundation be destroyed you know what can the righteous do you know and and um i think you know as men you know we we form the foundation of society and and i know you know some say well the family is but you know even the family is jacked up if the man is not there you know and and thank god for our women who have you know had to navigate those those single mom spaces um and do it well with grace and strength um but you know god's plan is for us as men to take our rightful place to be able to be good godly leaders and to stand up for righteousness and to lead our homes well, to lead ourselves well. I mean, you know, first rule of leadership, you lead yourself well before you lead anybody else. And um, and I think that that's why, you know, society has been failing because men have been focused on trying to do all these other things except leading themselves well first. And, and that's why we see, um, you know, the, the, the slow decay of, of uh, morality in society uh, because of the lack of responsibility that the men have taken. Well said, well said, 100%. So uh, let's bring it in for a landing, but where should, where should we send people? Obviously, the book Authenticity, I, I'm listening to it on Audible. It's available in everything on Amazon, you know, paperback, Kindle, Audible. Uh, my friend David reads it to you, and it's great to hear <laughs> you, right? It is your voice, right? It, it, you know, actually, it's not, it, it, we, but we chose... We chose somebody who we thought would, me and my wife did, who we okay. thought would represent correctly and sounded very similar. So so I wasn't trying to fool you. Um, well done. wanted somebody who had a very similar vibe. I, I, I thought I was listening to you. So that's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> and and uh, what website would people, if they want, if you're anywhere in the Chicago area or you're visiting through the area, uh, where where would they find more information? Sure, sure. Um, if they want to know more about our church, Living Word Christian Center, they can go to livingwd.org. That's livingwd.org. And if they want to know uh, more about the book, uh, Authentic, they can go to my website, davidswinston.com. That's S as Samuel, S. Winston, davidswinston.com. And uh, you can learn all about the book. You can go order the book, um, gives you the various links. It's available on Amazon. It's available on Audible. Uh, it's available as an ebook, and it's available in many uh, places where books are sold. So you can check it out. I believe it's really going to bless you. Do you have a YouTube channel of where I, you're? I, sh I sure do. Yeah, yeah. You can find me, um, David S. Winston, also is my YouTube channel. So you can go to youtube.com slash David S. Winston. Fantastic. I was I was telling David before we started that, you know, I, I listen to stuff while I wash dishes. I, I uh, not professionally, but, you know, here at home, <laughs> as I wash the dishes, I listen to stuff. And that's why I've been listening to your book. And uh, I'll have to check out your YouTube channel as well. So that's good, man. Awesome. 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 I, I, I really appreciate you. And, and thank you so much. And I really believe in this message of authenticity. I mean, it's really changed my life. And having you know the confidence to be myself and the courage to release my greatness and and that courage to release your greatness is simply about being able to withstand the pressure or the force of the struggle that forces potential out of you you know and sometimes we get stuck in these places and and situations where we feel like you know God what have you done to us you know you you invited me into a chaotic situation or you've left me out here to dry uh, but that's not at all what God is doing I believe that it's oftentimes the pressure that comes in the midst of that situation that shows us more about ourselves than we can see by ourselves. And out of that, we start to discover that there's more to us than meets the eye. And we'll start to see our greatness come out and then see that, wait, God wants to use this to be able to help people and advance his kingdom. And so I'm excited to spread this message and I appreciate your time and, and platform and allowing me to do so. Wow. I, I love it, man. And I, I'm so glad that I got to introduce you to um, my my people as well. And I'll I'll say, you know, I was just thinking of a 
a story. When I was with you guys 15 years ago, I was there for the international ministers conference, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it was the mi missions and ministers conference at the time. That was it. And there was there was like 4,500 leaders that were all there. And I got up and spoke. And it was one of these things preparing for it to mentally going through like, I don't have a three piece suit. I don't have a, you know, whatever. <laughs> but coming to the place of I'm just going to be myself. And mm -hmm. so I had jeans, I was wearing my Pumas and whatever dress shirt. And I got up and I spoke. And I remember being in the back room with your dad afterward. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I, I love the fact that you wore your sneakers. Uh, I think he called them your tennis shoes. I love that you wore your tennis <laughs> yes. shoes. And that you, uh, you know, I have all these guys out here with their expensive suits on, but you decided to come and be yourself. Yeah. It's like you could see right into the thought process of, some of that struggle that I had had leading into it of like, well, how do I, how do I culturally step into this environment that I is not my environment instead of just, just be myself. And right. he just, he spoke right to it. And I just remember that because, you know, we didn't have a whole lot, lot of time together, but, but his, um, that was his, uh, his one, observation which which cut right through like wow man i i so appreciate that and the 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 uh affirmation the you know that i was was it stuck with me you know here for yeah years. so please say say hello to your father for me say hello to your wife nikki for me and uh guys i highly recommend go find go follow them on instagram facebook get the book it's beautiful i love that cover man and Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll land it right there. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for being with us, David. So appreciate you. Thank you so much.